How are we doing? Can you all hear me? Rock and roll. I just want you to know that I achieved two personal goals today. The first, I didn't rip my pants on the way up to the stage. Thank you. Number two is I got the church to play Paper Planes by MIA as a walk-up song. So two for two on today. Thank you very much. For those of you that I don't know, I'm Mike DeYoung. Um, I live here in New Orleans with my beautiful and sexy wife, Heather. We have a, yeah. We have a two-year-old Mac who's crazy back there, and we're expecting uh, a, a little girl in December, so we're real excited about that. Thank you. We've been in New Orleans about over three years. We've been at Vintage for about three years. Uh, my, my work brought me down here, but I uh, was born and raised in Chicago. Born and raised in Chicago. Went to uh, Taylor University. So for anyone who knows small Christian colleges, it's in the middle of nowhere, Upland, Indiana, where I got my bachelor's in finance. And I started in asset management right after that. Um, since then, I've become a certified financial planner and a uh, certified investment management analyst certificate with an executive education from Yale. And so I've spent the better part of the past decade working with money. And I like to start most of my talks off with a story. And it was a story that I read in the Times, uh, I think two weeks ago. And it was about two 18-year-old identical twins, Imal and Juan. Has anyone read that? So anyone see that in the, in the Times? It was a story that they're two South American identical brothers who was born to a, a husband and a wife, and they were too poor to actually keep the kids, so they put them up for adoption. And they got adopted over the United States. Both of them are thriving here, but neither the husband or the wife had seen either one of them in 18 years. And so on, the 18th, on their 18th birthday, the 18th anniversary of them being adopted, the husband went to the wife and said, I'm going to let you see your sons for the 18th anniversary. So she got so excited. She's always wanted to see her boys. And so she cooked this big dinner. The day finally came, and in came Juan. And she threw her arms around him in a big hug, and he was sharing about what he was doing, and he was thriving in the United States. He's actually going to university, study finance. And about 30 minutes went by, and they were all both kind of sitting there, and the wife looked at the husband and said, man, I can't wait to see him all. And he said, well, you know what they say. Once you've seen Juan, you've seen them all. And wrapped up, thank you. <laughs> taking several of you longer than I thought. Wrapped up in that little bit of a dad joke is some principles about money, right? and goals, and what's important to us. And, and that's what we're going to talk about today. I understand that money is, is the last thing a lot of us want to talk about, right? It's an uncomfortable situation for many of us, whether we have a little or we have a lot. It's a tough conversation. But, but why talk about money? It's my cover page. Here's what we're going to talk about today, because I have a content page. Money matters. Money matters. Then we're going to talk about our goals, spending habits, debt, and finally we're going to talk a little bit about our credit score. And, and so what I, I want us all to leave today with, with not that you're going to use everything in each one of our presentations. I think Sarah did an excellent job at helping you learn how to find out where you are. How to, how to find out where you are so you can know where you're going, right? Yogi Berra says you have to know where you're going because otherwise you might end up somewhere else, right? And so we're going to talk about our goals so we want to know where we want to go. Then we're going to talk about spending habits to make sure we can get there. And then finally, debt so we don't get derailed on our, our content. But why talk about money? Because money matters. Money matters. 16 of Jesus' 38 parables had to do with money. Actually, 15% of every word that came out of Jesus' mouth pertained to money. Why? Is it because Jesus needs us to give the money that he gave to him, he gave to us back to him? Probably not, right? It's because it's a heart issue. And I can test that money will lead our hearts every time. Not your money will go where your heart is, that your heart oftentimes goes where your money is. I have an acquaintance over on the East Coast who really never cared much about Africa until he started donating to the Congo. He now has 11 kids and two of them are actually from the Congo and he keeps up on it on a pretty regular basis right? Where our money goes, our heart will follow. Here's a stat for you. 
household income. If you make over $34,000, you're in the top 1% of earners in the world as a couple. Household income. So here's the problem. We're too busy trying to figure out how to get rich and not busy enough trying to figure out how to be rich. There's a study done in 2016 that said the average American thinks that enough is 20% more than they have. And rich is twice what they have. The problem with that is our definition of enough and rich changes our income changes, right? So if you made $35,000, enough was $42,000. Rich was $70,000. The problem is that same $35,000 earner, when he makes 70, isn't rich, right? Some of us in the room have been there, right? Now, enough is 85,000 and rich is 140. And it keeps growing. And so what we're going to spend some time tonight is learning how to be rich. Because in order to be rich by the world standards, it's $34,000. So we, we talk about goals. A study was done in 2015 that showed there was actually very little correlation between money and happiness. Now, some people in this room may say that's not true. I would contest it is. And what they found, actually, is that up until a household income of about $75,000, for every dollar that you made up until $75,000, you were marginally happier. After $75,000, that quit. And actually, when that household income hit $125,000, it started going the other way. You were actually less happy, less content, less peaceful for every dollar you made over $125,000. You see, money is a balancing act. Money is a lot like food intake. And I know we, love, we live in New Orleans. I love good New Orleans food, right? But just like we can eat too little or too much, or we can eat things that are good for us and nourish our body, or eat things that taste really good but probably aren't great for our waistlines, right? The same thing is true with money. We can spend too little or too much. We can save too little or too much. I was actually working with one of my clients who was working with one of his a couple weeks back. And this little old lady who has since passed lived in complete frugality, amassed a net worth of over $5 million, but never really spent any money on herself or gave any away and had no heirs for the money. She died with $5 million in the bank, nobody close to her, no one to give the money to. We can spend and save too little and too much. And so we talk about goals, right? Because our money should exemplify what our goals is. There was an excellent quote given in our, our sermon a couple weeks back, right? Some of you get it. That money is a horrible God, but an excellent servant. Keep in mind that your money is not the end goal. It's a means to an end. It's a means to your goal. And so some examples of goals that we may have is an emergency fund. Three to six months of our spending so that if something were to go wrong, you were to get hurt, injured, lose your job, you would have a cushion to fall back on. A house, maybe saving for the house of our gym, saving to build the house or saving to buy our first house. Major purchases like a car, a vacation, or other fun like a boat. Does anyone remember, maybe older folks in the room, where we actually used to save for this stuff? And we didn't just put it on a credit card and worry about it later, right? Thank you, right? We should be saving, <laughs> you're not old. We should be saving for these things. Retirement, utilizing 401ks at work, utilizing IRAs, utilizing Roth IRAs. Steve's gonna get to that in a little bit. Education goals for ourselves, for our kids, for our grandkids. Possibly buying a business, finally becoming our own boss. And then finally another goal would be generosity. Giving to the local church, giving to a local university, giving to a local charity. So Warren Buffett has a quote. And he says, The chains of habit are too light to be felt until they're too heavy to be broken. You will have habits years from now that you decide to put into practice when you leave today. So we're going to talk a little bit about spending and our spending habits. Our spendings should exemplify our goals. And so when we talk about our spending habits, what we want to first do is analyze. Sarah did an excellent job at talking about budgets, 
where we are and how to analyze where exactly we are with our money, whether we are at a deficit or a surplus. After that, we're going to have our saving and giving goals. And then we're going to prioritize and cut so that we can hit them. And so how are we going to do that? The four keystones of successful spending. First, live within your means. If you make $40,000, don't spend forty-five. dollars But if you make $70,000, you can probably spend $45,000, right? Live within our means. Make sure there's more money coming into our account than it's leaving. Second, find the best value. This is a major point of contention in my household. I like to buy lots of very cheap stuff. <laughs> my wife does not like to have lots of very cheap stuff in our house. Why? Because it breaks. And I'll be the first one to admit it. I buy it. I'll buy the, the cheaper version because it was $5 cheaper than what happens inevitably. It breaks. So when I say find the best value, I don't say buy the cheapest stuff, but buy quality stuff that's going to last a long time. Cut excessive spending. We all have our, our vices or the things that we like to spend more money on, and I'm not here to tell you that you can't have those. But take a look at your budget, analyze it, and if there's places that are excessive, we should cut those. And finally, we're going to talk at the end here about rejecting consumer debt. So I'm going to talk for about five minutes here on how to cut spending, and I want you all to hear me when I say this. I don't think that you should apply every single thing that I say in this section to your personal life. These are just examples of ways that you might find extra space in your budget if these aren't your particular goals. So the first is food costs. We could go out to eat less. We could give up our, our Starbucks uh, every day. We could buy less expensive groceries at the store. Shelter. We could lower our rent costs. We could share our rental with somebody. We could negotiate rent increases or we could buy rather than rent. For homeowners, know what you can afford. One of the number one mistakes I see people make is buying a house that's more than they can afford because the bank said they could have it. Well, what's the bank? Not that all banks are evil, but what's the bank's main motivation? Make to make money. So if they give you a bigger loan and you're paying more interest, they make more money. So when you go to buy a house, make sure you know what you can afford. You can rent out a room in your house. There's all sorts of Airbnbs and, and long-term rentals. We could refinance. Rates are still considerably low right now. This is a big one in New Orleans right now, which is why I threw it on there. Those of you who are homeowners, you can appeal your property tax. Some of you are laughing. You could reduce utility usage. For transportation, research before you, before you buy a new car. Make sure you know what you're buying and, and that it's long-term a good investment for you. You could buy a car with cash. Use doesn't necessarily mean lots of maintenance. Oftentimes, it is the best value out there. Make sure you're servicing your car rather than letting it die down a little bit and having major purchases. Energy costs. You could drive efficiently. We could be thrifty at home to the lights off. <laughs> Service and maintain what you have and investigate energy efficiency when buying. With clothing, avoid dry cleaning. Dry cleaning is very expensive in the city. Don't chase the New Year's fashions. Minimize expensive accessories. Repay your debt. Avoid consumer debt as a whole. Utilize no fee cards. With phone and cable, you can renegotiate your contracts every two to three years and get better deals in, in the new packages that are up. And then finally, with medical expenses. Shop your health insurance if you don't get it through work. Ask for second opinions when it comes to your health. Finally, utilize preventative care. If you go to the doctor every year, there's a good chance they're going to catch it early and you're going to avoid major medical expenses. There's also other benefits to catching it early rather than it just being about your money. <laughs> but make sure we're going for the preventative care and we can prepay. So we get to debt. And I'm not telling you that good debt, bad debt, no debt. This is what I have found to be most helpful, that I don't believe that all debt is a bad thing. But I do believe there is good debt and there is bad debt. What's good debt? Good debt is an asset or an investment that increases in value over its lifetime. Things like college, things like business debt or house debt. There is bad debt. Bad debt is usually consumed or depreciates over time like a car loan or a credit card loan. 
Does anybody know what the average rate on a credit card in America is today? 19%. 19%. Which means if you have $10,000 in credit card debt today, you're going to pay, I've always been told not to do math in public, so we're going to round up to 20. <laughs> you're going to pay about $2,000 over the course of, year, of the year in your debt. Which means you just paid something for nothing. That means every purchase that you made on that credit card is now 20% more expensive. And so that's what we want to be avoiding is that bad debt. That thing that it's worth less in three years from now than it is today. So if you have debt, I understand this isn't applicable to everyone in the room, but for some people this is extremely applicable. If you have that, there's two different camps that you fall in if you did your personal balance sheet. You either have equity or you don't have equity. If you have equity, some of your options are borrowing against the cash value of insurance policy. You can sell investments typically outside of an IRA because inside of an IRA or 401k gets pretty expensive. You can use your home equity as a home equity line to lower the rate that you're paying. Or you can borrow against your 401k. Always that if you have equity, we can get rid of that consumer debt. If you don't have equity, which is where probably most people who have debt fall in. What can you do? I understand that debt can oftentimes feel like a mountain that there's no way that we can ever get up it, right? And what do they say? The, the only way to eat an elephant is one bite at a time, right? And so what can we do if you don't have equity? We can reduce our credit card interest rates. We can apply for other credit cards that have a lower interest rate. We can cut up our credit cards. When I say cut up our credit cards, what I would like to see if, if you have them is consolidate those into a lower interest loan, something like from SoFi or, or Lightning Loan. Um, one of these things where you can get a rate from 5 to 10% rather than that 15 to 25% that you might be paying on your credit cards. Or you could also utilize debt stacking, which is the debt elimination method that we're going to talk here about today. So I know it's a little small, so I'm going to read it to you. But here's what we have on the left-hand side. We have five different accounts and our monthly payments next to them. So you have retail card number one, credit card number two, car loan, credit card number one, and then our mortgage payment. And these are listed in order of the interest rate that you're paying, with the highest being on top and the lowest typically being your mortgage on the bottom. And the idea of debt stacking is that once you pay off your target account, which in the first, first column here is your retail credit card, that $220 that you were paying on your retail, retail credit card number one is going to fully go to the next highest interest account, which is going to be your credit card number two. So instead of in the first couple months where you were paying $353 for your credit card number two, you're now paying $573 to that account. Once that account's paid off, we're going to take that and apply it fully to the car loan. So instead of paying 551 to your car, you're going to pay $1,124, and so on and so forth. What this does is eliminates our highest interest payment loans and allows us to eliminate much quicker. So without debt sacking, in this particular hypothetical, it would take you 24 years and three months to pay off your debt. You save zero interest. The interest paid was $214 thousand dollars and you pay 27.20 a month with debt stacking in this particular hypothetical you paid it off in nine years and one month you saved a hundred and thirty thousand dollars in interest payments only paid about eighty four thousand and you paid the same amount per month as you would have if you would have just spread it out evenly so for those of you who are consolidating debt who have a lot of debt, this is a great way to eliminate debt in a smarter, more efficient way. As we talk about debt and credit scores, here's what a credit score is, because for years and years and years, I had no idea what it is and why I needed it to be good, right? A credit score is a three-digit score that lenders use to determine your viability of paying back a loan. What does it do for you? It's important because it often determines whether or not you get the loan, and if you get it, how much you pay in interest. 
And so right here is an example of where your credit score may be and what that means. If you're between 300 and 579, it's very poor. 580 to 669, it's fair. 670 to 739 is good. 740 to 800 basically is very good. And exceptional is 800 and above. Where can you find this? Most banks now on their app will allow you to look at it at no harm to your credit report. So how do we get these numbers? What's most influential when it comes? The most influential is going to be your total credit usage and balance. How much debt you have and how much debt are you allowed to have? The pro tip here is try to keep it under 30% utilization rate, which means if you have $100,000 in a debt available to you, keep it under $30,000. Number two, your credit mix and experience. It's helpful to maintain a healthy mix of accounts. Having some credit cards, having some car loans, having a house, a different mix of accounts. The next one is your payment history. Pay your bills on time. Pay them on time. When they come due every month, make sure you pay them. Then age of credit history and new accounts. Make sure that we're not churning our accounts all the time to get the newest points every single time as possible. Points are great, but having a better credit score is going to save you way more money in the long run. And so we talked a little bit about why money matters today. Talked a little bit about why money matters. We talked about our goals, what they could be. We talked about how our spending should exemplify our goals. Talked about ways to cut our spending. Talked about good versus debt, bad, good versus bad debt. And finally, our credit score. I want to thank you for having me here today. And I want to thank you for coming out. I know that on a Tuesday night, it's easier to stay at home than it is to, to come out. And so I hope that something I said either rings true for you or something that Sarah or Steve said tonight will also ring true. But I think I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Brick at this point. Thank you very much.